was a notorious drug dealer. He was a high market mover. When his w wife, Rachel, found out, she quickly left him, along with their son, Dominic. They ran away, and Chris didn't know where they went. So he told his colleagues that she had stolen millions of dollars from him and their drug operation. Mr. Kimball was Dominic's kindergarten teacher, who also, not long before, was a detective who'd actually arrested Crisp. When Crisp got released from prison, he tracked down Rachel, his ex-wife, and their son Dominic. And he found out where Dominic was in school, in kindergarten, in Mr. Kimball's class. And he came up with a plan to steal his son back. And so he went to the school, and he started a fire in part of the school. And as all the smoke alarms went off, and as kids and teachers poured out of the school, he ran in and he snatched his son, Dominic. Mr. Kimball, his teacher, knew that there was something wrong, and he tracked down Dominic, and then he had a standoff with Crisp. And not long after that standoff began, Mr. Kimball was successful only to then be blindsided by Chris's mother, Eleanor, who pulled a gun on Mr. Kimball. And that is where our recording of Kindergarten Cop ended, when I was in fourth grade and I was homesick. And as I'd invested two hours on the couch of watching this video, I didn't know how it ended. All I knew that Arnold Schwarzenegger, our hero, the one-time detective, now kindergarten teacher Mr. Kimball, was now having a gun pointed at him by Chris's mother, Eleanor. How would the story end? I would not know because I grew up in an era where we had something called VCRs, and you had to insert the the physical tape into a VCR, and you had to actually tell the VCR how long to record something, and it's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. Thanks for watching, Mom. Love you. Make sure you take some time today to tell your mom that you love her. Send her a text. Better yet, give her a phone call. Let her know that you love her. And since it's Mother's Day, I will tell everybody it was my father's fault that he didn't record the movie long enough for me, but I had no idea what happened. How would the movie end? And then my dad would tell me, well, son, everything turned out, but it just wasn't the same. It just wasn't the same because I didn't get to see it. I'd been watching the movie for a couple hours. I didn't feel good. It was taking my mind off things, and it had me, and then I didn't get to see it because the recording ended. Endings are important. Endings matter. If you've ever been invested in a television series, maybe The Sopranos or maybe another show that you've been invested in for a really long time, and you've, you've followed this series for a couple years, and then you get to the final episode. If you've ever, ever been invested in something for a really long time, and then it just ends and it leaves you wanting more, it changes your outlook on the whole series. If you've ever read a good book and you've just been engrossed in it, and then you get to the end... And it just, it just leaves you wanting more. It, it leaves you disappointed in all the time that you spent reading, all the time that you spent watching. This morning, we're going to look at a very important ending. We're going to look at the end of Matthew's gospel. We're going to look at the end of his account of Jesus' life and his ministry and his gospel. And when we look at the end, what we're going to see is something that is very important and has implications for all of us. So if you have your phones or your tablets, you can follow along with us under the events section. If, if you're far away, just put in the zip code 54201. Again, that zip code's 54201. Lakeside Community Church will pop up. Follow our event there. There you can follow along with us on your phones or your tablets as we dive in this morning to Matthew 28, starting in verse 16, where we read these words. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Now the eleven disciples 
they went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Of course, we know that originally there were 12 disciples. Jesus had many followers, but there were 12 disciples who followed him day in and day out through the, through the course of his three-year ministry. One of them, of course, was Judas, who ultimately would betray Jesus, and he had, at this point had committed suicide. And so there were 11 disciples remaining. This comes after what we've looked at the last two weeks. This comes after Jesus has already met with Thomas, and he's talked to Thomas about his doubt. And we, we looked in how we saw that in terms of doubt, it's not something that we ever have to run away from God with, but rather it's something that we can lean into and it's something that we can be honest about with God because God already knows what we're experiencing and the things that we're thinking. And we are just utterly convinced that we serve a God who loves us. And in the same way that Jesus reached out his hands to Thomas and said, take your finger and touch my wounds and see for yourself that it is as I've told you it would be. That's the same God that we serve. It's the same God who loves us. And when we have moments and seasons of doubt, we need to lean into those and take them to God, and he will be faithful to prove himself in the course of those moments. And it doesn't mean he's going to do it in the exact manner that we want him to, but he will reveal himself to us. We saw last week the conversation that Jesus had with Peter, one of his closest followers, the one who, the one who told Jesus, I will die. I will die before I would ever deny you. They, they could kill me before, before, I would ever, before I would ever not acknowledge you. And just hours later, in front of a teenage girl, Peter would deny Jesus three times. He would run away in shame. And then Jesus sought him out, and he, he restored him. This comes on the heels of all of that. And now the 11 disciples are together again in another town, and they're having the last encounter that Matthew would record for us in the ministry of Jesus. Verse 17 says, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And, and don't, don't miss out on this. If you want to know if you can trust scripture, this is, one of, this is one of the things that I love. This is one of the things that I love about scripture, and that is the unfiltered honesty of scripture. The unfiltered honesty that we have throughout scripture. If you're coming up with a narrative, if you're making up something, if you're trying to convince people something that isn't true, the last thing that you're going to record here is that there are some people who are still doubting. You're just not going to include it. If you have something to hide, you're not going to offer this fact. It's not like this, this question was asked. This is freely offered because what Scripture is, it's an, it's an authoritative, reliable account. It's an authoritative, reliable account. And when you have the truth on your side, there's nothing to hide. And so since we can lean into the truths of Scripture, we don't, have to be, we don't have to be worried about the fact that we can look in and see that something could potentially be damaging because the truth is the truth. And so even if something is potentially damaging, it's going to be reported because that is the case. And so if you ever have questions about the reliability of Scripture or whether or not you can count on it, just, just think about this verse right here and the fact that if this is something that's being made up and if this is something that isn't true, there is no benefit whatsoever to including this detail. That here, even after Jesus has risen from the dead, here, even after Jesus has gone and he's had other conversations with people, there are some of his followers who still see Jesus and still have doubts in their minds. They worshiped, but there were also some who doubted. And I want to encourage you, wherever you're watching from today, whatever situation you're going through, whatever your life is like right now, I want to encourage you that we are glad that you're taking the time to watch us. We're glad that you're taking the time to engage with Scripture. We're glad that you're taking the time to, to wrestle through these things. You might be at a point right now where you are firmly convinced in your mind of who Jesus is, and we are so glad that you are watching along with us, but you might be wrestling right now through some of the darkest seasons of your life. You might be wrestling through things you don't even want to speak about. You might be wrestling about things that you're embarrassed about, that you're ashamed of, and I want to encourage you 
I want to encourage you that even if that's you, and even if today, honestly, through this stream, in your heart of hearts, you're faking it right now because you, you don't know where you stand, or maybe you do, and maybe your mind is just riddled and ravaged with doubt, I want to encourage you. You don't have to run, and you don't have to walk through that process alone. As we talked about a couple weeks ago, God is not repelled by that, but rather God is ready and willing to reveal himself to you. And there's nothing to hide. There's nothing to fear. Truth is on our side. So much so that even something that could potentially be damaging to the cause, Matthew freely offers up because he wants to tell the whole story. And when the truth is on your side, you have nothing to worry about. Verse 18 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. So here are the 11 disciples, and they are back, and they're having their encounter with Jesus. Most of them worship. Some of them are still wrestling through doubts. They're wrestling through questions. They've got things that are plaguing their minds. And Jesus starts with this statement. All authority on hev- in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He basically says this. In essence, remember who wins. Remember who wins. Today, you might be in a place where you are, you're just you're freaking out. And it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It just means there's so much uncertainty. It means there are so many things that are happening in this world, so many factors that have come into play that you don't know where, where even to begin. You look, at the, you look at the unemployment and it's hit close to your home. And what maybe started with the promise of a furlough is now just gone to to complete being told that you're not going to be brought back. Maybe you don't know where the grocery money's coming from next week. You're just not sure where, where that money's going to come from. Or maybe it's got nothing to do with that. Maybe it's an entirely different situation altogether. Maybe right now in the midst of this chaos, you found yourself in an incredibly blessed situation where a number of people have had to cut back, you actually have more work than you know what to do with. Maybe things in, in in terms of finances right now are fine, and you don't have a fear in the world, but there's a situation in your heart. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's something that you're dealing with. Maybe it's about your own past. I don't know what the case is, but maybe there's something in your mind right now that just day in and day out keeps you awake at night. When, when, you, when you sleep, you barely sleep because you wake up constantly thinking about it. As you go through your day, you try to, you try to put your mind elsewhere, but it can't, and those thoughts just keep creeping back in over and over and over. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's worry. Maybe it's uncertainty. Maybe it's a situation that you wish desperately God would intervene in and you could control the outcome of, but you can't. And it's just having to let go. And every time you let go, you just hold on, but you know you have to let go, but you just grab at it again. And there's this issue of control that's weighing you down because you're trying desperately to control the actions of somebody else whose actions can't be controlled by you. And there's this tension that you live in. I don't know what it is for you, but I do know that if you're not experiencing it today, you will in a week or a month from now because that's part of life. And we've all been there, and we will all be there again. And in those moments, at that time, when the uncertainty and the anxiety and the worry and the desperation and the desire to control what you can't control all creep in. I want you to do something. Step one is I want you to remember who wins. Remember who wins. Remember that your circumstances and your outcome are not defined by the trouble and the trials that you currently face. 
remember who wins. Remember that Jesus is ultimately victorious. And here's what he says. All authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is victorious. He's victorious over our faults. He's victorious over our sins. He's victorious over death. He's victorious over hell. We have nothing to fear because Jesus has won the victory. Remember who wins. And remember the results of the victory. That Jesus is greater than anything. And he is ultimately the one who is in control. So here he is with his 11 disciples who are worshiping him. And there are some doubts at play as well in their minds. Just as there may be in your mind today. And he says, hey, I want you to remember something. I win. I won. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. I'm the winning team. You've heard the, you've heard the, the old adage that winners get to write the history books. Well, Jesus is about to tell us what the results of this victory are. And verse 19 says this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Jesus says, I've won. All authority in heaven and on earth is mine. So here is what I'm telling you to do. This is what I'm telling you to go do now. Go and make disciples of all nations. Take this hope that you have as a result of what I've accomplished on your behalf, as a result of the fact that I love you and I desire a relationship with you and I have redeemed you and I can restore you. Take this hope and proclaim it. Take it and proclaim it. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. He tells his disciples, go and scatter across the world and share this message of hope. Share this victory. Now, to the disciples, the message was go scatter. To take this message literally across the world. Because they were in a very small geographical location. And while the message to us is still go and make disciples, don't think you have to go across the world in order to fulfill what Jesus has called us to do. Start with your neighbor. Start with a coworker. Some of you should go across the world because that's how God's wired you and that's the passion that God's given you and that's how God's equipped you. And we're not saying there's anything wrong with that. In fact, we want to celebrate that and we're saying go and listen to that call that God has birthed in your life. But the vast majority of us, that's not the call that God has given to us. And this isn't an idea that in order for us to be faithful to this, we have to board a plane and go to a a nation across the world when there's somebody who lives right next door to us who doesn't know the hope of Jesus. When there's somebody we work beside for 40 to 50 to 60 hours a week who doesn't know the hope of Jesus. When there's somebody in our family who doesn't have the hope of Jesus. These are the final few verses of Matthew. This is the final instruction that Jesus gives. This is how he ends it. And he says, go and make disciples. So what that means for all of us is we have to be willing to tell our story. We have to be willing to tell our story of what Jesus has done for us. That's a great starting point, is be willing to tell your story. Maybe you're not an extrovert. Maybe you struggle. Maybe you don't have all the words. Another way that you can do do this is invite them to watch a stream with you. Host a streaming party. 
Invite them over if you've got enough room in your house and you're not worried about it. If you, if you are worried about it, then, then just send them the link and talk about it afterwards. Invite them to watch, to watch a lakeside service or invite them to watch a stream. Do a book club with somebody. And pick a book that's going to generate questions that you can come in and then fill the void. There are a number of ways to do this. But discover a way that you can be intentional about sharing the hope of Jesus that you experience in your life with people who desperately need it. This is why as a church, it's our core mission. The reason that we exist is to help people move one step closer to Jesus and reach those far from him. Because notice what Jesus said, a little wordplay here. Notice what Jesus said. He didn't say, go out and make decisions for me. He said, make disciples. And that doesn't mean that we only go out and seek people who don't know Jesus, but we also help them develop in their spiritual journey. The work of discipleship is not done at the time that somebody makes a decision to follow Jesus. In a way, it's just beginning. And so we want to link arms with you and we want to walk with you through every step of your spiritual journey. And obviously the starting point for that step is introducing you to a relationship with a God who loves you, who has restored you and wants to redeem you, who desperately seeks a relationship with you. You are loved and you are valued by your creator. But the work of God does not end in your life the moment you accept what Jesus has done on your behalf. It says, go and make disciples of all people. And as his followers, that is our obligation. And the best way to do that is to tell our story. The best way to do that is to invite somebody to an event, to a stream, to a church service. The best way to do that is a book club. You're like, well, you just mentioned a number of best ways to do that because the best way for me isn't going to be the best way for you, isn't going to be the best way for somebody else. And God did not wire you in a certain way so that you are wired in one way and then he has different expectations for you to just bust out. No, God wired you in the perfect way that he wanted to wire you and he's given you the gifts and abilities that he has for a reason. And so leverage whatever those gifts are for his glory. You don't have to memorize some set of... Ver- no. Start with your story and share the hope of Jesus that you've experienced. And whatever form that looks like for you, the important thing is that you're actually doing it. And then verse 19 continues. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So they've made the decision to follow Jesus. The next step, the next step to that is to baptize somebody. It's a public profession of of what you have made the choice to do. It's letting people know about your faith. That's why at Lakeside, we baptize people after they've made the decision to follow Jesus. Because we believe it's, it's, the, it's the most biblical means of practicing baptism. That after somebody's made the decision to be a disciple, after somebody's made the decision to follow Jesus, they then reveal that decision to people by being baptized. And bat- the reason we do it after, after they've made the decision to follow Jesus and also the reason that we dunk people all the way under and back up is it serves as a powerful picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, but also the transformation that goes on in all of our lives at the moment that we give our lives over to Jesus. And then verse 20 says this, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Observe all that I have commanded. This is a call to obedience. This is a call for those of us who made the decision to follow Jesus, that our lives need to look different as a result of the fact that we follow Jesus. That this is one of the proofs of whether or not we really follow Jesus. Not that we can earn our salvation. Not that, we, not, that, not that our salvation is dependent upon the things that we do. But rather out of response of gratitude and love 
from us for all that God has done for us. We acknowledge that his plan is better than our plan. We live our lives according to the way that he has called us to live our lives rather than the way that we always want to live our lives. We can't create God in our own version. We can't, we can't decipher which parts of God we like and follow those parts and then which parts of God we think need to be changed up a little bit and so either ignore those parts or just disregard them. That's not how it works. What we've just built is we've built an idol. But we aren't truly worshiping God. The call for those of us who've made the decision to follow Jesus is very simply this that our lives would look more and more like him. And what that means for all of us in different ways is that our lives need to conform. And there are things that that's going to require of all of us that we don't want to do because they feel unnatural, because it means we have to deny certain aspects of things that we don't want to deny. But if we're truly following Jesus... The call for us is to live lives of obedience. Does this mean you're always going to get it right? No, but what it does mean is that there should be angst when you don't, and there should actually be a struggle and not just, well, I just, I can't get it. Are you living your life the way that God wants? Or are you creating your own God in the image that you've desired because you like these aspects and you like these things about God, but these things you're not really crazy about, so you're just going to ignore or push them away? And the last part of verse 20 says this, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the last statement of Matthew's gospel. This is how the book ends. The promise of Jesus, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And what Matthew's just done is he's come full circle. Because in Matthew 1, 23, where he starts talking about the birth of Jesus, he references the prophet Isaiah. And he says this, and he, meaning Jesus, will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Do you notice this? That the arrival of Jesus is proclaimed. The arrival of Jesus is proclaimed with the same promise that the final statement that Jesus makes in the book proclaims. That God is with you. Today, God is with you. That in the midst of any isolation you may fear, feel, in the midst of any fear you may feel, in the midst of any uncertainty that you experience, in the midst of pain that is unbearable, in the midst of your doubt, in the midst of all of it, you are not alone. And the very promise that was proclaimed for the coming of Jesus is the promise that is still true today in your life and in my life that we are never alone and we never have to walk through life alone. That God is with us. That He is victorious. That he is one. That all authority in heaven and in this broken world 
has been given to Jesus. And no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter what you're going through, you aren't alone. But God, your creator, is with you. So I just want to encourage you. Stop living in fear. Stop living in fear. Stop letting uncertainty rule your world and rule your life. Because you are not alone. God is with you. So the question is, what do we do with all this? Well, first, in a world that is uncertain, in a world that is, that is full of anxiety and fear, tell your story of hope. Tell the story of what Jesus has done for you. Tell the story of why in the midst of all of this uncertainty, hopelessness does not define you. Second, remember God wins. You need to remember it. Just remember God wins. I want to challenge you every day this week. Wake up and meditate on the fact that God wins. God is bigger than a pandemic. God is bigger than uncertainty. God is bigger than being furloughed. God is, God is bigger than everything. God wins. He's got this. And he's got you. You are not alone. And third, acknowledge your fear. Acknowledge your doubts. Acknowledge your uncertainty. Stop letting them live in the shadows. Stop feeling like you have to battle all of them by yourself. Stop fighting a losing battle alone. Bring it into the light. Because the promise of God that was looked forward to before the birth of Jesus is the promise that Jesus leaves the book of Matthew with. That he is with you. So as people who know Jesus, let's make sure that our lives are defined by hope. Let's make sure that we share that hope. Let's take that message to the people we encounter who need the hope of Jesus. God, I pray that we would be people who live hopeful lives. I pray whatever we're fighting and experiencing that we wouldn't let to live in the darkness, that we wouldn't feel like we have to do it alone, but we would remember that you are with us. That we would remember that you are victorious. I pray, God, that you'd give each of us opportunities, whether it's a text or a phone call, a meeting, just 
just to share with somebody this week the hope that we have as a result of you and what you've done for us. I pray that we would be your light. I pray, God, that we would shine. I pray, God, that we would just radiate as people of hope in a time of hopelessness. And that while we have things that we're uncertain about, we are not plagued by uncertainty because of who you are. So God, use us to spread your message of hope and love and redemption. For your glory and your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.